Now this cool little knucklehead I just picked up and fired up for you guys the other day has some really interesting history. Especially this chassis. It was at the Big Boogie in 1978 in Bowling Green, Kentucky. Now, just give a little panoramic here around the bike. You have to understand, at the time this bike was ridden, in the 70s and 80s, people changed their motors out like people change underwear. For example, my 65 fan head that I had, starting in, I uh, got it in March of uh, 1982, was a chopper, had a stock wishbone frame that had been raked to the stock springer so low to the ground, I couldn't even go over speed bumps. I had to go around them. And by the time I got rid of that chassis, I had a shovel motor in it. I had a flathead motor in it. I had the panhead in it. And I forget what all else. At least three different motors just to go for a ride. But I kept the chassis. Well, that's what people did at the time. It's the chassis that made the bike. You follow? It wasn't the motor. Today, it's like, ooh, it's a knucklehead. It's like, well, uh... The knucklehead in 1978 was a pile of shit. Today everybody wants them. Back then, you know what people wanted? They wanted a shovel head. A shovel head was brand new. If you had money, which this guy obviously did, you ordered your brand new jammer chopper chassis, which is what this is. This is a complete jammer kit. And you bought your brand new shovel head, and you took your brand new shovel head motor and training out, and stuck it in that chassis and put a cool paint job on it. You had instant shop. By the time you got done with that, you had about 12 grand in a bike that would sell for about 3,500 bucks. So you had to have money. That was top of the line. That was the best of the best. If you had stupid money, you paid a fabricator or you did it yourself to fab all this cool stuff up. You know, it might have cost you about 15 to 20 grand. You have to understand in 1978, that police bike right there was about seven, eight hundred bucks. That was it. That was it. That was it. A brand new shovel head was four thousand dollars. Okay, most areas of the country, you could buy a house for under ten thousand. A house with land. With land. So, I'm going to show you these pictures right here. We're going to discuss the history of why this chopper is so cool and why it's so important. These are actual photos. Here. Let me flip this around so I can see what I'm doing. <clears throat> this is this chassis here. June 1978. You follow? Here's a real far shot picture of the bike in front of the house. No date. Here's another one. Right here. And this is June 1978. That's when they actually got the picture roll developed. Another one right here. In June 1978. Now... <clears throat> For you to understand this period of history, I first have to take you back. So we're going to go back in time. When these knuckles here in back of me were just a little old, right? <clears throat> we got a 41. First year FL, the two-tone green one. We got a 40 EL. That's all they had, ELs and 40. Another 40 EL. By the time the FL hit, you couldn't you couldn't hardly sell an EL. You certainly couldn't sell a pre-40. It didn't have the look. People wanted the full fenders in the 16s. They didn't want that old look from yesteryear. They wanted the new look. And then the panhead came out. Well, go ride yourself a knucklehead, a stock knucklehead. Then go ride a stock panhead. And the front end handles doesn't pull go through the corners. It's about twice as fast. These are new bikes. So, unless you were just poor man dealing with, okay, I guess I'll deal with it, motorcycle. You wanted a new panhead. 
pan hits never came out of, out of favor. So let's fast forward a little bit. <clears throat> the chopper days started in the 50s. A chopper at the time in the 50s meant you cut your front fender off, zing. You cut your rear fender off, zing, and you chopped it. That's what a chopper was in the mid 50s. There were instructions in the magazines. I actually put a, a video or a post up on uh, Facebook about that, of how to chop your bike. That was, that was the first originating. Today we call them bobbers, but they were actually called choppers at the time because you chopped the parts. So, <clears throat> anyhow, as these bikes were ridden, they got in accidents. You know what happened in the 50s? The junkyards, today they're full of Hondas. At the time, they were full of knuckleheads and flatheads. Well, the young kid, the 18 year old kid with no money, you know what he did? He went down to the junkyard, found himself a junk knucklehead and somebody wrecked. And here's a fork off of that, and here's a motor off of that, and a frame off of that, and he put it together for about 10 bucks. Okay? So when you find this old knuckle chopper, this old knuckle bobber, and the tank has changed, and the rear fender's changed, and oh, by the way, it's got a different fork, and one forward is this, and one forward is that, it was a junk bike out of the junkyard. <clears throat> it's not a survivor. It's a junk bike out of the fucking junkyard. That's what it is. That's the reality. That's the cold hard reality. So, <clears throat> why did they put them together like that? It was cheap. Fat Bob's and Dash cost money. These were young kids broke driving yesterday's version of the $100 Honda out of the fucking junkyard. That's what it was. It was cheap. That's all it was. It was a cheap mode of transportation. And there were young kids and they built their bikes like that because it was cheap. And because some of the guys did it, the other guys said, well, I want to do that too. Next thing you know, we got bobbers running around with a, a springer and a knuckle motor because it was the cheapest way to go. The guy by 57, if you had money, man, you had a pinhead with all the bells and whistles and the lights and the bags and a wow, and the cabbage cutters and all that. Well, what happened in the panhead days? 55, they came out with Timken bearings. You could stroke it reliably. They tried stroking the knuckleheads and probably blew them up. Okay? They tried stroking the early panheads. Well, it lasted a little bit longer, but it still blew up. By the time the Timken bearings came out, much more reliable, could handle a lot more lower end. Came out in 55. You know when the first straight leg came out? Late 54. So in 55, they also came out with this magic thing called an FLH. An FLH, a factory V race cam, just like a TT bike. Factory ported and polished heads, just like a TT bike. I had my 56 Green Bug FLH to 14,000 feet in Colorado. I didn't have to reject the carbs. Everybody else was fucking around with their stupid carb, fouling plugs and everything else. I just went zing right over the hill, no problem, because I had an FLH, you understand? They run, they scream, they'll cruise 70. These bikes don't cruise 70 so easy. They tend to blow up. You gotta back it off, let it recirculate the oil pressure and build it back up. The panheads, especially the FLHs, were screaming, the FLH was FL hot. That's what the H stands for, it's hot. You had a hot motor. Well, by the time the shovel heads came out, it just was an FLH meant you had this big dresser thing. But they actually had different styles. They had FL, they had FLHS, a bunch of different styles, but the average vernacular meant you had just a big dresser thing, big garbage bag wagon. So, in the 60s, you had, in South Central LA, you had a, a, a group of, of black boys, started with one shop, the same shop that built the Easy Rider bikes. And they got to be different. You follow? They had to be different. So he started chopping them and extending the front ends. Okay, this is pre Jammer. This is pre Paco. This is pre everybody. He's doing it himself. And his little group of guys, they were called Chosen Few. It was a club. And I actually had some of the members in the Chosen Few used to come into my shop in the 80s as well as other clubs, but they, they, they were regulars until the president got 
thrown in prison for uh, killing somebody. But anyways, that's the 80s. <clears throat> so, Easy Rider movie gets made. Somehow, Dennis Hopper hooks up with, with one guy and says, yeah, yeah, I can build you a couple of bikes. So he builds them, his style of bikes, which were, which were choppers, who knew the guy running the shop who actually finished the bikes. They were actually uh, police bikes that had, uh, were sold at auction. His panheads were still, you know, fairly new. They were still coming off the line in the auction. So <clears throat> I knew a guy in the late 60s. He was driving up to Oregon in the late 60s, early 70s. He was buying stock running knuckleheads off the farms for $50 and bringing them to L.A. and selling them for $500. By the end of the week, they'd be chopped. Bam. Just like that. Okay? Cheap bikes. And he was making money. What they do with the extra parts? Most of the time they threw it out. It wasn't worth taking to the swap meet. Unless you had a big place, you just magically owned and have to move. All that stuff went in the attic, maybe, if, if you thought about it. I know of dealers that moved their shops in the 60s. And those several hundred knuckle frames they threw out in the strat yard. Because it wasn't worth any money. You couldn't put a shovel head in it without altering it. Shovel frames, you know, panhead frames, all this stuff was around. It was so common. I can't even believe to tell you how common it was even in the 80s. By the late 80s, early 90s, I used to build stock knuckleheads every month out of swap meat parts. And it was dramatically more common in the 60s and 70s. Oh my God. It was, it was common. It's like finding twin cam parts at a swap meet. It's like, really? It was everywhere. So, you have to understand the culture of the time. In the 30s, weed became illegal. Marijuana, cannabis, because, because the owner of the biggest newspaper conglomeration in the U.S., called William Randolph Hearst, had just spent a ton of money on timber so he could have cheap pulp for the mills for his newspapers to make the paper and they developed a cheap way of making paper from marijuana stems okay and so he did a smear campaign to outlaw it because he was going to lose so much money if they started making this cheap paper and so you you became crazy you became like the devil you did all kinds of insane stuff and people actually believed, just like they do today on the 6 o'clock news, they believed what the paper said. I saw it on the internet. It must be fucking real. So, <clears throat> it was called reefer madness. That's what it was. So, marijuana went way underground. The boys went to war. They came home. They were young kids. If you look through the stuff I've posted... In the 30s and early 40s, prior to the war, I mean, people wore their ties, they wore their vests, they wore their shirt, they wore dress, pants, and shoes as daily attire, okay? That, it was as common then as wearing shorts and a t-shirt with cut-off sleeves today. It was daily attire. Now, the styles change rather rapidly every generation, just like that, and attitudes change. The young kids don't want to be like grandma, they don't want to be like daddy, so they have their own stuff, they have their own slang, their own saying, their own things that they do. So the young boys go to war and they come out. And they're wearing cut, cut, uh, rolled up jeans, they're wearing rolled up shirts with a cigarette in, in the side. They got a cigarette, they got their beer bottle. And reefer went so underground, it was actually like heroin today, uh, shall we say in the, in the 80s basically. It was in the inner city which is generally your Latino and black populations. It was out of the white consciousness at that time. Prior to illegality, I mean, it was everywhere. The lockers, lawyers, everybody smoked it. It was, it was a cool thing. It was, you know, alcohol was illegal in 1930, but weed was good. So, <clears throat> now you're going, how does all this relate? Because if you don't understand the attitude changes, you're not going to understand what I'm going to tell you. So pay attention. So what happened, now the 60s come around. The Beatles are singing about girls and love, okay? Girls are wearing beehive hairdos, and, and, and you got uh, sock hops and dances in the late 50s and early 60s. Well, 62, 63, this is normal. By 69, 
you've got love ins, you've got Woodstock, you've got nudity and fucking in any inner city park, hate Ashbury, you got acid, you got people experimenting with drugs, weed is back on, all the white kids want to be cool, they're all smoking weed, they're all doing drugs, LSDs everywhere. When I grew up in the 60s, I was a young kid, I was born in 62. By the late 60s, if we went to the park, National Park, whatever park, we went to the beach, man, clothes are off, yay, running around naked. People were fucking openly. It was not uncommon. It wasn't like a daily occurrence. You had to go to somewhere like Kate Ashbury to see it every day, but it was not uncommon. Nobody thought, gee, ooh, child sex, oh my God. It was like, uh, it's sex, people. Who cared? That's the reality of it. Nobody thought about it. Nobody thought, oh, she's under 18. Nobody cared. Nobody cared. Didn't matter at all. A, a, a woman wanted to say, oh, he raped me? You know what they said? Well, what were you wearing? Uh, well, you know, I was at the park and my titties were out and I had a miniskirt on. It's like, whatever, case dismissed. Uh-uh. No, 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 no. Back in the 70s, I had chicks ask me, so how many chicks have you given lewds to so you fucked them? Common. I never did that because that doesn't do anything for me. I want my chick to be into what I'm doing. But that was considered normal sex. That was considered normal sex. Most of the guys did that. They, they thought it was great. The chicks thought it was great. I had no girls that would get all looted up and take the clothes off hoping somebody fucked them. Hoping they got gang banged. This was common shit in the 70s. They didn't say sex, drugs, and rock and roll because they didn't have sex. What came first? The sex. Let me give you an idea how easy this was. Even in the early 80s, I get my first bike. The 70s were way more intense. I'm still a young kid. I'm just kind of watching it happen on the outskirts. I get my first bike in 81. I turned uh, 19, September 7th, 1981. By the end of the month, I got my first Harley. I just turned 19, 1981 lowrider, okay? First bike. You wanna know how easy it was to get laid? You pull up to a chick and go, hey, you're cute, wanna, wanna go for a ride? You wanna fuck? Bam! Just like that, off to the park and boom, clothes are off. Right in the park, right in the open, no problem. I can't even tell you how many times I did that. I have no idea. Everybody did it. So we thought, I mean, I was shocked. I, in 1985, I had a girl come over to the shop when we work on her Sportster. Of course, you know, magic word, hey, you're cute, wanna fuck? She's all, I'm a virgin. I'm like, huh? How old are you? Oh, 25, and you're a virgin? I'm thinking, man, this chick's gotta be loopy in the head. Oh my God, I couldn't believe it. So the perception is this. Everybody in LA drives a car. Well, some people actually take the bus. Some people actually ride a bicycle. But the vast majority of people drive a car. The vast majority of people were having sex just like that. All your grandmothers, you know what they were doing? They were fucking in the park. They were getting gang banged in the fucking park and had a good time. That's where our generation comes from. So <clears throat> this bike here, you have to understand, Easy Rider comes out, the movie. It has shit like this, long bikes. Wow, never seen that before. Holy fuck. Everybody's gotta have one. Next thing you know, Easy Rider with magazine hits. Man, it's like wildfire across the country. It's like a forest fire, you can't stop. They were chopping them as fast as they could get them. I mean, they'd literally line up 100 frames and go down the road like this with a torch, cut the necks out. I know a lot of guys who did that. That was so common. Chopping them as fast as you could get them. Companies like Paco and Jammer started up making custom oil tanks and custom frames and custom kits. The, the chopper days of the 70s were just, were just immense. The boys came back from Vietnam. They had free money. They wanted to get pussy. They wanted to get a bike. If you were really hard up, you just extended your forks and rode a stock bike. But you had to have your chopper. That's why, comparatively speaking, there's not very many stock shovel heads. <laughs> That's why there's almost no stock knuckleheads or pan heads, because the easy rider. Man, the, the chopper craze was on. Oh my God. 
Well, the sex craze has been coming on since the late 60s. The 70s hit. Motorcycles are dangerous. Sex was, sex was not considered dangerous. They had the pill, okay? That's what really opened this, the sexuality of people, the pill. The chick couldn't get pregnant. Fuck, I, don't, I, can, I can have this little pill, and I can fuck as many dudes as I want, and I get pregnant? Yay, me! That was the attitude. You got Penthouse coming out. You had Playboy. You had all kinds of other porno magazines. There was porno... It, you could go and just, for a quarter, get a, a newspaper with all kinds of chicks in there spreading their legs. Hey, here's my phone number. Give me a call. Let's have sex. <clears throat> this is in the big cities. Uh, 1978, Bowling Green, Kentucky. This bike, this chassis was there. Now, Bowling Green, Kentucky, at this particular event, was off the chain. You have to understand, in the 60s, we had biker movies, you know, fucking chicks, beating people up. Well, the young kids wanted to be like the bikers they saw in the movies. So they started doing that for real. Okay, somebody said something to you, you're loaded, the chick's fucking semi-naked. Well, I, let, let me put it this way. 1978, I'm 16 years old. I'm living across the street from Michael McCloskey's. Go to the park, in my grandmother's apartment. And I hear this guy playing music on his guitar. His name's Rick. And I beat on the door, say, hey, man, hit me in, let me in. I play, let's hook up, woo, woo, We became friends. I'm over at his place one night, and here's this chick, and she, and I'm like, what, what's up with her? And he's like, man, she's looted out. She wants somebody to fuck her. And she was naked. So I pushed her on the bed, and I fucked her. He's like, whoa, 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 this ain't a hotel. It's like, well, you just said she wants somebody to fuck her. I'm helping her out. Today, that's rape. Back then, it was sex. I have no idea who this chick was. Couldn't tell you. Everybody did. Everybody did. So common. So common. If, if you went to a party and you didn't get laid, whoa, you're fucking weird. It was really, really unusual. And I didn't even have a bike. Didn't even have a bike. You had a bike, man. You had so much pussy coming out of your arm. Oh, my God. In the early 80s, if I wasn't getting fucked in an hour and a half, it was a bad day. It was a bad day. It was a bad day. And the chicks were way worse than the dudes. You know, people didn't wear panties. They didn't wear bras. It didn't happen. All this bra and panty wearing came out after those chicks had kids and their kids became teenagers. All of a sudden, oh, I, I didn't do that. They started wearing bras and panties and all that. In the 70s and early 80s, ah, no, no, no. Very unusual. You were really weird to wear a bra and have panties. Oh, yeah. And miniskirts were in. Whew. In the late 60s and early 70s, miniskirts, and then it became bell-bottom blue jeans. I had lots of those. So again, why is this bike so important? Because this bike was at that event. When the long bike craze took off, the parties got crazy. The runs got crazy. Naked chicks everywhere, drugs everywhere. People would be loaded on this or that. A little argument, next thing you know, the knives would come out and they'd be fighting and, and stabbing each other. It was just off the chain. Off the chain. If a dude saw a chick naked, she was into fucking, so he thought, he was loaded, and they fucked him, just like that. Pushed him down on the ground and fucked him, just like that. Boom! Right in front of everybody. So we're going to read you a little commentary of what happened when the spike was there. 1979, these bikes, these long bikes, they evaporated. You couldn't even sell them. You know why? Because of what happened at events like what this was at. This was at one of the last big chopper blowouts. And the cops started pulling people over. Combination of that, the people with the long bike like this, especially the real long ones, you can't corner or stop so good. And people started dying on their motorcycles. So if you didn't want to get hassled and you wanted to be able to handle your bike, instantly the style became short bobber with fat bobs you could actually go down the road. Became the 1980 Y-Glide. Okay, that became the style overnight by 1979. Couldn't even sell this bike. That's why the shovel head motor got pulled out and this knucklehead motor got stuck in. Because 
all of a sudden, it was not cool. So he had a, a cheap knuckle motor and cranny, he stuck that in. 1982, I bought my first knuckle motor, 600 bucks. I got laughed out of the room. The boys were like, you dumb fucking kid. Man, we buy whole bikes for 600 bucks. You bought a motor? What the fuck is wrong with you? I thought it was going to die with that motor if I finally sold it. it. Took me almost two years to sell that bitch for $800. I could not believe it. I'm like, oh, well, this is like that. It's like, no, no, we don't like that shit. We want shell heads. What the fuck is wrong with you? Man, they, people, I, I, I don't get embarrassed too easy, but they did their best to really embarrass me. I paid that kind of stupid ass motor money for a motor. So, <clears throat> anyhow, let me read you the account from someone who was there at this party. This was the last big chopper blowout. The last of the last. Before the cops clamped down so fucking hard, this bike went out of style. This is history. You want a real chopper? Well, there it is. This is a real chopper from back in the day who saw it is at the event. So we're going to read it to you here. Okay. <clears throat> Big Boogie 78 Bowling Green, Kentucky. I was there. Anyone else from here? This is on the V-Twin Forum. Okay. Guy calls himself Gray Rider. So let me page this down. Well, this is, you know, if you weren't there, well, guys, what's a big boogie? And Gray Rider says, I rode this. Boom, he had a chopper. He extended the forks. Whoops. So common. I've had lots of those. Gray Rider says, it was a major motorcycle meet at the drag strip in Bowling Green, Kentucky in 1978. And I says, that is sweet, man. Hey, that was me waving at the bank the other day. So I saw you and waved back as I was almost past you. Didn't recognize you getting in a car. You know, <clears throat> says, I didn't get stateside until 88. What other old bikes do you have you had? Which was your fave? So he tells him about his bikes. Then he says, there were rapes, murders, fights, and then they called in the National Guard. It was the pre-rub area. Era. I was scared. Okay, this is when all the young kids wanted to be bikers like they saw in the movies. Now you have to understand why I was scared to buy a bike when I was 16, a little bitty skinny kid from Micah. I didn't know anybody. I didn't feel like getting raped and murdered. Because that was what was going on. This was at the Boogie. I've been in similar situations when I lived in Washington, D.C., except in the early 90s, people were shooting each other. Crime was very bad. And he says, Gray, were you the one I saw naked in the creek that runs down by the campground? He posts his bike again. He says, you look a little small for that bike, Gray. But I like the pigtails. <laughs> and he says, I about drowned in that thing. It's more of a river. Were you there, Bob? He says, thanks, makes me look younger. He says, yeah, I was there. Came from North Carolina, was living then. I think I remember sitting up on some sort of crosswalk over the burnout lane during some of the races. There was one of the big clubs there. That was the last year, last year of the big drags there after all the trouble. I actually live about 100 miles from Bowling Green in Western, you know, they have a couple of small bike rallies at the drag strip, but nothing like the old nationals. Okay, now we gotta go to page two.
Then Gray Rider says, I think they estimated that there were around 100,000 in attendance. A tornado hit the place on the last day. It sure was crazy, old school crazy, rub free, just hardcore bikers. The AP was supposed to go with me, but something happened that she didn't. Probably a good thing. I don't know if I could have protected her. I found my buddy naked taking a bath in the little boat ride pond one day. I was scared. I have stories. Holy cow, I was there celebrating my 21st birthday at some little bar just outside BB. Gunshots in the night, people peddling dope like street vendors, impromptu drags, in the campgrounds, naked people everywhere. Ah, oh, those were the days. Gray, do you remember those two naked guys at, on the electric glide, passenger riding backwards? Or the tall brunette walking around with a show me your crank sign? I was scared too, a kid riding a 750 Honda chopper in a sea of real bikers. I had a ball. Another thing close to it I've experienced is the Little Sturgis, Kentucky. Not them particularly, but that seemed to be the norm. He says about the, the two guys riding naked. And last draft says, I was there. Met my wife up to be about two weeks earlier. She was new to riding. Met her in a bar in Chicago. After taking her out to dinner, asked her if she would like to go to this great biker event. She had no idea what to expect. She said, sure. We camped out in the campgrounds, woke up to gunfire. Pup tent almost got run over a number of times. No shower facilities. People were going into town and using a car wash to shower. It was rare to see a woman who wasn't topless. She was very pristine at the time, ended up getting in an accident, broke my collarbone, and cut above eye. It was one wild event. Made Sturgis look like a family picnic. Made Sturgis look like a family picnic. And today it is a family picnic. A lot of memories from Beach Band. Most of our rides later were solo and not to gatherings like this, have a lot of pictures from 78. Okay, that's what it was really like. And that event, and events like that, caused the cops to clamp down on everybody and made these bikes go out of style. That's the real history. So if you want a bike, a real bike, from the real chopper days, this bike is for sale. It's $25,000. Give me an email, huntingharleys at gmail.com. That's huntingharleys at gmail.com, huntingharleys at gmail.com. And I will see you all on the next video.